I'm going to go ahead and hide that and I'm going to go ahead and hand it off to our presenter. Today we have uh, Jolene Cardenas, who is uh, with CICASA, is the Director of Communications and Community Engagement. Jolene. Great, thank you so much, Maria. I'm really excited to present today uh, on reproductive justice and sexual violence and the intersections uh, and how that correlates with the work that our advocates are doing in the field. Thank you all for joining me today. This is a presentation created by Maria and myself. We presented uh, this to a group at Arte Sana's conference in May, and it uh, came across really, really well. So I'm excited to share this with you all. Uh, so let's get started. So I uh, am the current um, director of communications and community engagement at CICASA. I come from a background of, with a graduate degree in women's studies and communication as my undergrad. Um, but my most recent work was with Color, which is uh, here in Denver. It's the Colorado Organization for Latina Opportunity and Reproductive Rights, which really got me introduced to reproductive justice on an organizing level. And it was such an amazing experience. I'm really happy to bring this topic to the forefront. Um, I think it really embraces all of the work that we do in uh, discussing oppression. So today we're gonna go into some topics that are a little hard to talk about. So if you need to remove yourself from this conversation or hit pause on the recording, that's totally fine. Just be good to yourself. That's always first and foremost. Today's learning objectives are, uh, we want to make sure that we talk about the interconnections between reproductive uh, oppression and sexual violence. And we're going to address uh, violence against folks in sexual and reproductive health services and learn uh, how we're going to um, recognize those and uh, confront those. We will also be exploring community response and resources that have been developed over the few or past uh, few decades. So to begin with, um, for those in the advocacy field, welcome. Thank you for attending this today. We wanted to give you a scenario about someone who came in to seek services from your office or your clinic and see what just came to mind and what you would do for support. Um, this individual, will, we have named Lupe, and they are a survivor of sexual violence. Before Lupe can utilize a service uh, provider like yours, uh, we want to ensure that Lupe has uh, the things that are available to be successful in her life. Uh, what does Lupe need to lead a healthy life? And what things would make it possible for Lupe to live with dignity? So instead of just typing in your answers, I'll have you maybe jot a few things down right now. Uh, that come to mind that would answer these questions that's a typical response from your uh, services uh, when it comes to helping an individual like Lupe. And just hold on to those answers because we are going to discuss those towards the end of the presentation as well once we learn a little bit more about reproductive justice and apply that lens. So I'll just give you a moment longer to really look over those questions and come up with a few answers. <clears throat> okay, so moving on, we're gonna start out with the definition of oppression, which is really the basis for reproductive justice in the first place. Reproductive justice is different than reproductive rights, which we'll go into here in just a moment, but it starts out with the definition of oppression, which is a systematic and pervasive mistreatment of individuals on the basis of their membership in a disadvantaged group. And I'm sure many of you have taken an anti-oppression course, and so you understand where the uh, systematic uh, problems come in, when it comes to uh, how oppression shows itself in our everyday lives. The first is on an interpersonal level from person to person. Next is how society creates a norm within the culture to uh, use oppressive structures. The next is how it's upheld within the institutional um, rank, which includes our workplaces, our uh, educational outlets, 
And next, it's structural. So the government in general, an overarching uh, system of oppression. Now, why does anti-oppression work? Why, why is that relative to the work that you do as an advocate? Well, we need to acknowledge that those systems of oppression exist for survivors. Uh, all of us have experienced being targets and agents of systems of oppression. It's not useful for any of us to argue about a, a hierarchy of oppression because we all, like it says above, experience that. We need to acknowledge that everything is interconnected. Um, confronting oppression will benefit everyone, of course. Placing blame helps no one. And uh, confronting social injustice is definitely, uh, it's painful work, but it's definitely joyful. And it is the life work of what we do in advocacy. Sexual violence itself is a result of oppression. And we need to understand how to best support survivors from those targeted populations. And that's really the key. It's best to start with yourself and understanding your unconscious biases, because we all have them, all of us. Uh, all oppression is interconnected, as we said before. And advocacy, the work that we do is social justice work. We have to acknowledge that in the work that we do. It doesn't work to bring a solution to someone who is experiencing oppression if there's if we can't start with the basic access to the resources that they need so here's a example of how oppression can be interconnected and we definitely in context need to understand that we all inherited and benefit from a system of oppression and we're all trying to learn to understand and dismantle that system of oppression each one of us no matter where we come from experience privilege on some level and i think that's um, something that folks have a hard time wrapping their heads around but it's true um, and if the, we can acknowledge that in the work that we do the more help we can be to someone oppression is a form of violence and as long as there's been oppression there's been a history of people working from their hearts and minds for liberation and rights for all we do have the power to respond in new ways to outdated models of oppression that hold us back in various ways. And I'm really excited to bring some of those to you today through the reproductive justice lens. So let's start with this term intersectionality, which I'm sure many of you have heard being used on social media in discussions about anti-oppression work. It's an academic term that has made it into the mainstream. And I'll admit, I think it's gotten a little carried away in the mainstream. Uh, really needs to go back to its roots, which is Kimberly Williams Crenshaw, who coined the term. And she is a third wave feminist theorist and joins these incredible other theorists. Some of this is just a, a sample of some of the theorists that are out there who have been doing the work of intersectionality since the uh, early 90s. Uh, this quote says, if we aren't intersectional, some of us, the most vulnerable, are going to fall through the cracks. We'll explore that in just a moment. <clears throat> but these are some of the names that I would recommend you look up if you're not familiar with third wave feminism. Uh, the second wave, for example, came during the women's liberation movement uh, in the 60s and 70s that really centered the experiences of middle class cisgendered white women and didn't really look into the queer community at all, didn't look into communities of color at all for uh, how to dismantle the oppression that they were facing. Um, so third wave feminism was an answer to that, talking about folks uh, who had been marginalized, centering their experiences and working from that point. Um, some of the greats I've listed here that have really inspired the work that I do and the work that many of those in uh, reproductive justice do. And this is a Rebecca Walker has come up and she's the daughter of Alice Walker, who wrote The Color Purple. And she came up with a definition of third wave, which is very lengthy. So I just provided a link for that. But I definitely recommend checking that out if you're not familiar. 
And we come to Loretta Ross, who is the mother of one of the founding mothers of the reproductive justice movement. And she is an incredible feminist activist. Uh, before we get to her comments, let's just go through the tenets of reproductive justice itself. A definition. So reproductive justice looks a little bit, a lot further actually than the general women's rights movement, which like I said, came out of second wave feminism, centers mostly middle-class cisgendered white women. And you see that a lot with the Roe versus Wade movement, even the Women's March centered a lot of women who, uh, of means who really didn't have to go up against a lot of access issues and oppress oppressive issues when it comes to um, reproductive choices. So to the first tenet of reproductive justice says that uh, everyone has the right not to have a child. Not only that, they do have the right to have a child. And furthermore, they have the right to parent children in safe and healthy environments. Now those three tenets are extremely important to reproductive justice. In addition, reproductive justice demands sexual autonomy and gender freedom for every human being, which I think is extremely important that we acknowledge, especially now. So before we go into too much detail about reproductive justice, I'm gonna pull up this video of Loretta Ross and give a quick introduction to the work that she does. Hopefully this works, there we go. Is that gonna work? Sorry about that, just one moment, we're having a bit of a delay. Are you able to hear? But I came from a very conservative family. I didn't learn anything about sex and sexuality at all, except what the Bible preached. I had an older cousin who committed incest against me, and I became pregnant. I was only 14, which is pretty broke away. I had very few choices. choices at that time, and all of a sudden I became a mother. And then in an attempt to prevent future pregnancies, I accepted the implantation of the Dalton Shield, which was an IUD uh, made by Edith Robert that ended up sterilizing 700,000 women around the world, and I was one of them. I went into a coma one night, got rushed to the hospital. They had to do a hysterectomy to save my life. I was like 23 years old. And so finally, I just got this really pissed off picture that this isn't right. I freaked out because, as far as I do in the African American community, we were still calling abortion the A word. I had a number of conversations with black women's organizations who were totally convinced that this was a white women's issue. So I told the story of my abortion and then all of a sudden we're in conversation about when other women had abortion, tell your truth and you don't get amazing results and responses. In the 1980s and 1990s, women started organizing Native American communities, Latina communities, Asian Pacific Islander communities, and the African American community. This explosion of organizing really gave rise to what we call the productive justice movement today. One of the things that we had to challenge the pro choice movement on was a singular focus on abortion. It's about abortion, but it's not just about abortion. Because we are women of color that come from communities always subjected to population control schemes, we fight equally hard for the right to have our children. And we have to fight for the right to raise our children that we have in safe and healthy environments. The human rights way of looking at the totality of women's life. And I really like to think that it's shifting the thinking 
Okay, so hopefully you all were able to hear the video okay. Um, the subtitles did come through. So if you weren't able to hear that, I apologize. There might have been some issues with our audio, but we did provide a link to you in the chat box. So definitely take a look at that and we will be sending this out for you. Oh, sorry, I don't know where that volume's coming from. Oh dear. <laughs> Give me just one moment here. Okay, sorry about that. Um, going back to my presentation, uh, Loretta Ross was really a, a part of the, an integral movement for reproductive justice. And uh, she helped uh, make sure that women of color were able to become organized. And it didn't just start in her area, it kind of went out into the rest of the country and became a, a, a movement. Um, for example, SPARC, Reproductive Justice Now, is an organization uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, that is still going strong to this very day. I definitely recommend you check them out. Um, they provided a lot of information for this presentation. And they um, put another definition here. Reproductive justice dictates that above rights, that the above rights, the ones that we just saw, must be possible to realize and enjoy with respect and dignity and free from violence or coercion. Furthermore, in agreement with international legal norms, RJ acknowledges that governing bodies and institutions have an obligation to respect, protect, and fulfill the above rights. And I think that's the most key part is that uh, it is a human rights issue. And we, as women of color, stand by these tenants. Now, reproductive justice is there to uh, make sure it lifts up the needs and voices of folks who've been marginalized and that includes everyone uh, reproductive rights and reproductive justice have a kind of a difference when it comes to um, expressing that the needs and the voices of the marginalized uh, we are very careful within reproductive justice to use gender neutral language in healthcare or in service providing. Um, it's very in, it's essential to base a lot of the work off of queer theory um, because of the discrimination and injustice that impacts uh, communities within the queer community, um, specifically trans and gender non-conformity conforming folks. Um, TGNB for short. Now you may have uh, been recently uh, in tune with the, some of the legislation that's going up against that community. Um, the effects of that can be detrimental because transgender folks, according to the research here, uh, require gender affirming medical care, such as hormone therapy, genital reconstruction, or top surgery, breast or chest surgery, and they may have a unique gynecological or urological needs. Um, the, this discrimination can put up barriers for basic 
uh, rights to health care that they need. Uh, they, this community can have deter, uh, things that deter them from seeking out health care, including transphobia, transmisogyny, and racism, and all of those things in, intersect uh, for this community. So those create very big barriers, delays, or inappropriate health care. So you can see the importance of making sure that your organization and the services that you provide acknowledge the, the barriers that exists for this community. This is a great tip sheet, and I did post this on our Facebook page recently. Uh, it's created by forgeforward.org, and you can get it, the link is included in this presentation. This is specific to sexual assault service providers, and I think it would be a great resource for everyone to print out uh, and have available for their um, staff and it goes through the importance of each one of these, language, manners, signage, client resources, supplies, and bathrooms, things that um, may be taken for granted um, based on privilege uh, if you are not part of that community. So I believe that uh, this is a really good resource and I hope that um, sharing it with you today is going to be helpful. Now, this uh, quote comes from someone within the abortion providing abortion care provider um, community who is just discussing um, the changes that their clinic had to go through. And I thought this was a significant uh, quote from them that not just women seek abortion care and it's high time we all acknowledged and respected that. There is terminology that is constantly changing within the queer community. Um, so it's always best to um, ask someone what they prefer as their identifier. But some include non-binary, gender queer, gender fluid, non-binary, gender fuck, genderless, a gender, non-gender, third gender, two spirit, bi gender, trans man, and trans woman. And there's our beautiful gender unicorn, which is another great thing to show that you're, you have a safe space within your advocacy uh, clinic or uh, providing uh, to, that, um, to that community. Because the gender unicorn reveals that there is no one way to express gender or to um, identify as a gender. And you can download that yourself. It looks like there's a, a link there on the page or you can print it out from this presentation. Okay, so <clears throat> uh, the transgender community has um, re most recently dealt with uh, their rights under attack to not have a child. Um, look, looking at this article from 2019 in Rewire, there is the Title 10 domestic gag rule and the US Department of Health and Human Services have put in a moral conscious rule that will allow doctors to refuse to treat trans folks based on religious beliefs and make the situation worse for an already vulnerable population. So we can see there where reproductive justice is not being upheld. And another example, in the tenant, one of the tenets of reproductive justice, the right to not have a child, for many, many decades now, uh, the Latinx community specifically has not been able to participate wholly in the right to choose when it comes to Roe versus Wade. For example, the Hyde Amendment, um, a member of the Latinx community, Rosie Jimenez, was one of the first victims to die because as a result of not having abortion, ac abortion care access uh, because of the Hyde Amendment, which denied uh, her insurance coverage for a safe abortion. And we see that repeated time and time again within communities of color. So while we are fighting for choice on one hand, there is a great barrier to absolute choice uh, for low-income uh, women who are on Medicaid um, because it, the Hyde Amendment states that uh, it only in the, with the life of the woman uh, is endangered, can they have access to an abortion? <clears throat> so on the other hand, now we're going to go diving into the right to have a child. We're going to watch a brief video, hopefully it won't get <laughs> muted. Um, 
on the sterilization history of the Latinx community. And there, there is also, and it's not just the Latinx community, there is also uh, a history of sterilization on other communities of color. Um, but this one I have a documentary for, so we're gonna take a look at that. Um, it's called No Mas Bebes, and it is seen through PBS. Um, give me just a moment here to get that open up for you. So this is just the trailer. Hey, Jolene, we aren't really getting much sound from this video. Hmm. Huh, okay, sorry about that. I'm not sure why it's not coming through. Okay, but you will be able to see that on the PowerPoint once it gets set up to you, so you'll be able to click on that. Um, but basically, it's the history of the Latinx community being pressured into uh, signing off on sterilization if they wanted to be out of pain during childbirth and just basically coerced into signing away their rights um, for motherhood. So that happened in the 60s and 70s and it happened across all um, minorities, actually, minority women. And I just recently found a story about it happening in the Native American community. I did not post it here, but I can share that out with Maria so that she can get that to everybody as well. So with an African American, oh, and Puerto Rican women, yes, as well. So Agatha is reminding me. <laughs> yeah, it happened, it happened a lot more frequently than folks realize. Um, so opposing sterilization abuse uh, was one of the big motivators to unite the Latinx community uh, during that time from LA all the way to New York. And it started at a grassroots level because no one was really concerned about those communities at all. So if anything was gonna get done, it had to get done within those uh, neighborhoods and you know, person to person themselves. Some of the examples uh, during this time came uh, to develop some of the biggest uh, organizations that uh, some of them still flourish today. And it's pretty incredible the work that they've done, including the National Chicana Conference, which happened in 1971, all the way up to 1998 with the establishment of the Colorado Organization for Latino Opportunity and Reproductive Rights here in uh, Colorado. Um, and we have the National Latina Institute for uh, reproductive health to thank for the model that um, Color has definitely expanded on. Um, they're all great organizations. Uh, going into the Puerto Rican history of reproductive justice, uh, we can highlight the right to safe and healthy environment, uh, which was definitely violated back in the 50s when the pill was just being um, produced and actually it was the Puerto Rican community was used as a testing ground for different strengths of the pill. Now it was definitely touted as one of the 20th century's most important inventions for women, but it definitely came at the expense of women of color within low-income communities in Puerto Rico because um, there were dangerous side effects. They were not told that they were under a clinical trial and very um, high dosages were also put out to find out what would work properly. But the women had no idea that that was what, they trusted that, that these were doctors and that they knew what was best for them. So they had no idea that they were under experiment. And if you wanna learn more about that, I've provided links to the PBS article and the Remescla article that gives you a little bit of history. There's a video here that goes with that as well, and you can click on it when the PowerPoint comes out to you. It's interesting because this video is the History Channel's version, and it's very whitewashed. There's no suffering. You don't see the oppressive um, coercion that went into 
uh, having the women sign up for these clinical trials. Um, so it's the basic history that we're taught about the pill and how it was a great breakthrough for women in women's liberation, but we don't see the darker sides um, where women were actually dying. And in response to not having a safe and healthy environment, um, there is the systematic violence movements, um, well, movements against systematic violence uh, that are all based in reproductive justice. The first one that I could think of that I'm most proud of is the Black Lives Matter movement because uh, it's it just centers that right to parent in a safe and healthy environment. And it just um, is a prime example of what happens when you don't have that available to you and you have to really be the, the grassroots uh, level organization to get that to happen in your community. Um, other examples include the movements against the ICE raids, the movement to end the school to prison pipeline, the movement to end labor trafficking, and the movement against the Muslim ban that was just recent in the last few years. Uh, the show me your papers law that happened in Arizona and Texas um, in the movement against those. Um, the movement for murder, murdered and uh, missing indigenous women, girls and two spirit, which is ongoing and actually is in response to environmental injustice as well. It's not just based on a healthy, well, it's, it's based on a healthy environment, but it's based on an, envir an environment for all. And what happens when your water is no, your good clean water is no longer accessible, your land is no longer accessible. The Me Too movement, which was started by Tarana Burke, who's a woman of color, giving voice to women of color uh, or victims of color for sexual assault movement and harassment. Uh, Transgender Day of Remembrance, which was just last month, <clears throat> and is a great way to be a little subversive on social media and show uh, that transgender folks are not invisible. And hashtag Crip the Vote, which was uh, started by the uh, folks within this disability movement, and that is used to show the importance of their vote and the needs that they are not seeing being met from their legislators. And each one of these has a link to each movement so that you can check out each one of those for further information. So the right to a safe and healthy environment really has a lot of, to do with folks' implicit bias when it comes to providing such an environment for uh, everyone to be able to enjoy and be able to parent in. If we look back on the history of implicit bias, we can see that it's rooted in 19th century myth. For example, this study of in 2017 is linking false beliefs about biological differences between black and white patients, um, saying that black folks have a higher tolerance to pain, but that is directly uh, a white supremacist uh, myth that was perpetuated by slave owners. And that historic bias sticks with folks even in the 21st century, which is kind of scary. Um, but we all have it and we all need to make sure that we check in on ourselves with that because it can be deadly. For example, black women are three to four times more likely to experience a pregnancy related death than white women. And for example, uh, Serene Williams, who is a very well-known tennis star and who has a lot of money and a lot of influence, still was not safe from this statistic. And you can read more about her birth story uh, in the Fortune uh, article from 2018. A lot of the roots from our modern uh, reproductive care comes from pain that Black women had to go through. And there's some history to that. I just provided one article, but you can go through the many, many um, different historical accounts of the experiments that were done on women without anesthesia uh, to get to where we are in the modern gynecology field. And so, Mother Lord has spoken. 
there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And that is a tenant that I hope everyone can take into account when they're providing services to the community. We all have the right to live from sexual assault and violence in all forms. And that comes in medical form, legal, advocacy, and there's definitely many others if you can think of some. And it's up to you to write those down, to really do some introspective work and think what other forms could that violence potentially show up for communities that have been traditionally marginalized. So if we go back and look at the list that folks put together in the beginning of this presentation about Lupe, what would our answers be now if we took a deeper dive into uh, what they're going through with a reproductive justice lens and base it off that framework? What does Lupe need to be successful in her life? What does she need to live a healthy life? And what would make it possible for Lupe to live with dignity? If you have some answers, we have some time, so you can type those in, and I would love to hear any feedback. Yeah, go ahead and type it into the chat box. So how would you answer any of those questions now that you've seen a little bit about reproductive justice? Would you take those in a little bit deeper? So for example, now that we know uh, Lupe possibly could come from a marginalized community, what answers or what questions do you think we might be able to provide or ask that would be a little bit more in depth as to what she's experiencing in her community? Such as, are you in a safe place if you didn't seek an abortion? If that is something that you would have to uh, go through, what are some of the limitations in your in your family life or in your community that you may run into? Or are you being coerced into using birth control? Things like that. So I'll let that sit for a little while. I'm going to go ahead and move on. If you have any feedback, please go ahead and type that into the chat box. That would be fantastic. So the next thing I'm just gonna go over with you briefly are organizations in the fight for reproductive justice. Uh, you won't see any real in-depth reproductive rights organizations here because like I said, this is a lot broader than just providing access to abortion care. Um, some of these do reproductive rights and reproductive justice at the same time. Um, but it's real important that we're able to answer the questions of reproductive justice when we look into this movement. Each one of these has a link to the organization, so you can check them out for yourselves. Uh, they're incredible organizations. They've all done really great work. Uh, and if you have others that you would recommend, please go ahead and uh, you can email those to me and I can add those to the presentation. But uh, definitely, if you have never heard of some of these organizations, I very much encourage you to check them out for yourself and see what answers they might have when it comes to responding to um, survivors of sexual assault and violence. So not only do we see reproductive justice within the uh, movement, but we also see it reflected in some media. And hopefully you've been able to check some of these out. 
Um, these are some examples that I thought were just really, really poignant when it comes to how reproductive justice can be seen and what you want to look for. Uh, when they see us on Netflix, it has to do with the case against five young boys in New York City who were um, falsely accused of raping a white woman. Roma is an incredible journey. It's on Netflix as well. I don't know if it's still available, but there is a trailer there uh, about um, domestic work in Mexico and the invisibility of the women um, behind the scenes, but the needs um, that they do run into when it comes to reproductive care. Um, if Beale Street Could Talk, of course, an amazing book and film. Uh, Precious, another amazing book and film, and Beloved from 1998 is also an incredible book and film. That was by Toni Morrison. Um, hopefully you've seen some of these. If not, I definitely encourage you to check them out and ask yourself some of those critical questions. It gives you a little bit of practice on how you can talk about reproductive justice with folks or some of the questions that may arise. You can always write them down. You can always um, talk to me or you can talk to the organizations that I've included in this presentation. They're always open to having discussions um, so that you can explore further what that means. And there is my information if you'd like to follow up on this presentation. I apologize for some of the hiccups on the videos because those were pretty significant, but I'm glad I was able to introduce you to Loretta Ross and Nawaz Bibis. So hopefully you'll be able to look at those videos for yourself once the presentation gets sent out to you. You can always email me with any questions or commentary. Um, you can definitely follow us. We do try to stick with the reproductive justice lens on all of our social media and are always willing to learn more. Um, this recording of the presentation will be presented on YouTube within the next couple of days as well. So you can share it around with your um, inner circles or you know your staff. Um, and if you have any things that you would like us to share on our social media, go ahead and send that over. We'll definitely be interested in learning more. And so here are our selected resources and you can check those out for yourself and that links to all of the things that we talked about today. Fantastic. Thank you, Jolene, for uh, sharing some time with us here today and doing this uh, webinar and uh, about reproductive justice. So a couple of things to do now. Um, any questions that you may have that has not been answered to the webinar, please send it to us and we will make sure that Jolene answers those directly to, with you. Um, we would like to uh, um, ask you to be on the lookout for an email containing copies of the materials and also um, with the materials within one and two business days and as well as we will be sending a, a, a reminder of the survey that will let us know what kind of what kind of uh, uh, webinars will you like to get, what kind of information you're looking forward to hear through this webinar. So please, please, please look out for that survey. We'll be coming out with it uh, within the one to the business days today and tomorrow. So please answer to those. Um, uh, also look out for the next webinar in January. Um, right now uh, that is in the works and it will be announced pretty soon. So thank you all for being here today. And we look forward to hear from your surveys, answers, and uh, hear from you in the next webinar in January. Happy holidays to you all. Take care. Bye-bye.